Well, good morning. Welcome to Southend Baptist Church live stream. We're excited that you're with us to worship this morning. We just pray this will be a time when the Holy Spirit will continue to speak to you, encourage you uh, through our time of worship and through our time in the Word. So would you join me for a word of prayer as we get started? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that no matter how we are dispersed, no matter where we find ourselves, you are with us as your children. Your desire is to draw us unto yourself that we might experience the fullness of your love and your grace and understand exactly who you are. May your holiness and your spirit just overwhelm us today as we hear your voice speak to us, not the voice of our singers or the voice of our pastor, but your voice. That's what we want us to hear. I just pray, Lord God, you would continue to speak in a powerful way and transform our lives. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, so if you didn't tune in a couple weeks ago, we started a new song, More Than Conquerors, and it comes from Romans 8, so you can look at that and you can see how it kind of configures into how we have victory in Jesus and how we are more than conquerors for him. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the life, you are the fire that's in my soul. Greater is 
will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our It's the reason and how it really just depicts on how everything we do and everything that we live for is for him. And that's the only reason why we're here and the only reason why we sing and the only reason just everything that we have. So please sing with us. We There's a reason I can sing. Jesus, there's a 
Well, good morning. We're uh, in probably the last of three messages in the book of James. We'll have those for about the next, uh, this week and the next two weeks. So I'll be praying for us as we kind of figure out the next uh, direction. I've been praying about where God would want us to go. So continue to pray along with me as we seek where in the word of God he would have us be at this time. Because I think God's in order and in control of all those things. And that's really an important part of what we do. We're in James chapter 5. Verses 1 through 6 this morning is where we'll be looking, and so if you have your copy of God's Word and you want to turn to there and follow along with me, I'm going to be reading here just a few moments, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. This is going to be an interesting message that last week was an exciting time of Easter, a celebration. This is a little bit more uh, nuts and bolts, a little bit more challenging for some of us. It's a text that I, you know, I I struggle with. There's some truths and principles in here that make following Christ, tell us what it means to truly follow our Savior and what it looks like, and James does a good job. So let's take a look at James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, and James writes, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are come up on, coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver has rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and, you, and they will consume you, your flesh, like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure." Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, which has been withheld by you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth, have led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of James, the elder, as he speaks to us today. I pray, Father, that you would give us wisdom and direction as we look at this, your word today, not so much to hear what we wanted to say, but, Father, to hear what you have to say to us as your people. I think the great reminder here is very true and very sound, and I just think it's one that speaks to each of our hearts. And I pray, Lord God, you use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to us, your people. Pray for each person that is listening and those that will listen later as well. I pray the Holy Spirit uses this time to empower us and to strengthen us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you notice, the title of this message is It's All His, and that being His, it's all God's. God owns everything. And Jesus, or excuse me, James starts this text uh, talking about some things. And, you know, I know for you sometimes and for many of us, we struggle with possessions and what possessions are. And, you know, it's interesting to watch as as children grow in our houses, you know, as we have our children grow up, how they kind of corner things and and things can become very important to us. We kind of hold take great stock in those possessions. And as we get older, those uh, things become more expensive. Those, whether they be cars or electronics or houses or whatever it is, those possessions that we have can cause us great strife at times, but also they give us comfort. We like those things. And that's really where James is going with here. He's talking about in this text, people who have much and people who need to take care of what they've been given, but also to use those things for God's purposes. Because everything that we have and the great principle that we see in this book and throughout the entire scriptures is ultimately God's. One of the things as I looked at this text, I thought of the the rich young ruler. You might remember that encounter that Jesus had in Luke 18 uh, with a gentleman who wanted to be his follower. And he came to him and he wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus heard him. He he said he had felt compassion for this young man. He he believed this young man was earnest. And he asked him, says, one thing you lack, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me. And the scripture says that young man went away sad because he owned many things. And I think of that text in line with this text. I think of that person's life and and how for many of us, there are things that God has asked us to surrender, to give up, to follow him. And we're like, Lord, I I don't really know if I'm willing to go that far, if I really will do that to follow you, because I'm I'm afraid. I mean, those possessions, they they matter to us, those things that we have. and, And I'm not telling you this morning to sell everything you own and follow Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we need to be careful with the things that we own, because as has been said by someone far wiser than I am, oftentimes the possessions we own can own us. They can become so much a part of what we are that we think we cannot function without them. And I think what's kind of interesting in the time that we find ourselves here in our nation and around the world is that some of the things that we once held on to that we thought were so important, that were so necessary for life, have been taken away from us. Things that we thought were just an absolute essential nature of our lives, possessions, activities, things that we heartily enjoyed and really wanted, those things are now gone. And will they come back? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I, I, I've told you before, and I keep people saying, well, when's it going to get back to normal? Like I'm some kind of prophet, and I know I have no idea. But I do know this, when it comes back, it won't be the same as it was, most likely. 
We're going to enter a new normal, a new world, a new different kind of doing things. And, and James is, I think, prepping us here in a lot of ways to help us understand that life is not about what you have. It's not about how much you garner. I know the American dream for some is the more things we gather, the more successful and safe we will feel. But we never find safety and security in possessions, do we? And most of us have experienced that in our lives. We've seen things come. We, we try to say, you know, this, if I have enough of this, you know, when is enough enough? And enough is never enough when it comes to garnering myself and making sure that I have enough possessions or enough to keep myself happy. We, we try, but we always want a little bit more. And James is trying to teach us here, and the Scriptures remind us here of that great truth. As we reminded of the young, rich, young ruler, there are other things we can think of that life and, and following Jesus sometimes does come with a rather high price. He asks us to surrender all, to follow him, to give up everything, and to trust him with our lives. If you remember the 12 disciples, a lot of people like to think, well, they were guys that just didn't have anything to do, and so they followed after Jesus. But many of them had livelihoods. They had, some of them had families that they walked away from to follow Jesus because he called them to follow him. And that same call that he had for those 12 is for those of us today. He's calling us to follow him no matter what that might mean, to trust him with our lives and to surrender our lives completely to him. And let's kind of move into the text a little bit. Is some things that James says about uh, our wealth and our riches. He says that he says material riches, as he talks about possessions, will become moth-eaten. In other words, they're they're, they're temporary. They're they're not the things that will decay and will fall apart. Of course, he's probably describing the clothes that people were wearing and the different possessions that they had in their day that were you know cloth nature that will be eaten by moths. But I think a, a lot of things that we have eventually will just turn to nothing. Everything that we already have was at one time probably someone else's. And what we have and possess today, as much as we like it, when we are gone, will be someone else's. Even the money in your bank account that is so valuable and the money in our retirement funds and all these things that we have, that's been passed around from other people have had it. You know, it's kind of interesting. One of the things I think about, if you ever get a, take a look the next time you have a dollar bill and look at it and, you know, they don't usually, you don't usually get a crisp new dollar bill, do you, when you go out and get stuff? Usually instead, what do you get is one that's been worn, been used. And I often wonder as I think about that is I wonder how many hands that's been through. Don't get germaphobic on me here. I know that would, we don't, some people would do that. But how many different ways that dollar bill has been used in its existence? It was once someone else's and now it's mine. And for a little bit, it'll be mine, but pretty soon I'll give it to someone else. And yet we find ourselves getting so attached to those things that we have for just a season that are just temporary And that, I believe, is where James is leading us here, that they really don't help us in the long run, and that's really not where our heart needs to be. Because I think the focus of this text isn't so much on railing against the rich and railing against possessions. It's upon helping us focus on our heart and who we are and what really matters to us, what really holds us, what will we give our lives to. And some in our world had given their lives to their possessions. They've made everything about earning more, making more, getting a bigger house, getting a nicer car, getting the the top you know, whatever electronic or whatever it is, those things that are so valuable, that's what our lives are about. And those things are nice, but those things don't last, do they? You know, I I like electronics just like the rest of you. I'm looking right here at my, you know, I've got a a tablet I'm looking at, which I'm reading my message on and the verses coming out. It's a great tool and I love it. But you know, they'll come out with a newer one here pretty soon. You know that, don't you? They always do. They come with something newer and better and, and, and more memory and faster and all those kind of things. And so, the same is true with those things that we acquire in life, whatever it is. Whether it be in, in James, as he talks about the, the clothes that people wear, or the, those things, those things kind of are, are good to have, but sometimes, you know, some people have to have the, the best fashion, the newest style. Have you ever noticed how styles change? If you remember how styles change, I'd encourage you to go back and look at some of those older pictures of yourself, those of us that have been around a little longer. Uh, you know, the way that some of the clothes we wore, those that have been around long enough to remember of the 70s and the 80s, uh, there were some style choices then that I don't know how to say it other than this. They are sad. Some of the hairstyles that some of us young men wore and uh, are kind of different, some of the uh, clothing, uh, i.e. leisure suits and other things, are really kind of scary to look at that people thought that was the thing that was going to last, but they're, they just pass with time. And so are our possessions. They come and they go, much like the fads of our culture come and go. And we need to understand that temporary nature of those. And James goes on to talk about these things as he's, as he's kind of walking through this, we're walking through this text, the things that are, you know, don't, don't focus on these things. He even talks about gold and silver. You know, some people think, well, that's what, what matters. If I just have enough of that, that will satisfy me. 
But he says, your gold and your silver have rusted. And their rust will be like a witness against you. And you will consume your flesh like fire. In the last days, so that you have stored up your treasure, your wealth, your money, your, your jewels, your, metal, all your precious metals, all these things, although they are good and they are helpful and they are nice to have, they will not last. They will not sustain you. And there will come a day when they will not matter to you anymore. And I think many of us have experienced that and seen that in the hearts and lives of others as they face some challenges. And I think of all this, there was an incident, another instance in the Gospels that comes to mind as I think of wealth and I think of how we use wealth. And you remember Jesus with the disciples, and he was in the temple and there were people walking in there and they, in those days they did offering differently than we did. They had a, a thing up at the front and you would come up and you would drop your money in this, this plate. It wasn't really a plate, it was almost like a, a, a big piece of, uh, I can't even, my, my brain's fried here, pottery, and it had this hole in the top, and you drop your money in there or whatever, and it would just go to the bottom. And, and the idea for a lot of people is they want a lot of change in there and make a big noise so it looked like they really gave a lot. And all these people were showing and bringing all these large sums of money in, and, and the disciples were just in awe, impressed by their offerings. And then this poor widow comes up, and she drops in a mite, which is not even a cent. It's just a small coin. And Jesus looks at his disciples and said, she gave more than all the rest of them put together. And they're like, What? Evidently, they thought Jesus flunked math. He didn't understand that. But they didn't understand what he said because the gift that she gave, she gave out of her poverty. She had nothing. That was all she had to live on, and she gave that to God as an offering to God. And that same principle applies, not so, it applies to money, but it also applies to our life. Are we willing to give God everything we have no matter what it might cost us, much as this widow did? And James is reminding us that all these things that we have will pass away, so don't focus your life on them. Instead, focus your life on what matters. You see, it's not having stuff that is wrong. Money is not the root of all evil. That is a misquote of the Scriptures. What does the Scripture say? It says the love of money is the root of all evil. When we make that our attachment, when we identify our possessions, when we become focused on those things as being the most important thing to us and garnering them and protecting them, then we've lost sight on who God is and what God desires to do with them. The possessions that we have, the things that we are given, we are stewards of them for a time to be used for God's glory and for God's purposes. And those of us that are able to understand that and apply that are those that are able to experience what God desires. And that's where we come up with that wonderful term stewardship that you like to have pastors talk about all the time because that's what we get accused of as preachers. Anytime we preach, we're talking about money. Well, if you're tuning in today, I am talking about money because the scripture is talking about money. It's talking about our lives. It's talking about being good stewards of our lives, giving and sharing of, our, of what we've been given so that others can experience God's goodness. He goes on to rail against them here, I thought, in a really interesting way, kind of a, kind of a strange thing when he talks about their gold and silver. He then goes on in verse 4, and he says, You pay the laborers who mowed your field, which has been withheld from you. They cry, You're not paying them fairly. You're not taking care of those who work for you. Those who are harvesting, he describes all these things. You are, you are accumulating for yourselves, but you're not providing for those that are doing the labor that makes what you have available. So he's basically telling us to take care of those who, who serve us, who accommodate us, who help us. We should provide for their needs. That's a part of the, the plan, the way. You should share with, what, with others what you have and not simply hoard it for your own benefit. And that principle applies to us as followers of Christ because if we don't give of what we have, how will the world be changed? If we don't give of our time, we don't give of our resources, we don't give of our money, will it really truly make a difference in the world around us? And I'm not talking about just giving your money. It's, this isn't a call today to just give your money to the church. It's a call today to use your money wisely, that your money is used to make a difference in the lives and the world in which you live. Because God gives us these gifts, these talents, these abilities for a reason. What if the praise team this morning decided, well, yeah, they can, they can sing, but they decided they didn't want to do that anymore. They decided, no. They didn't want to share those gifts with you. They'd rather just keep them themselves. And, you know, I don't know. I've, I've been seeing a lot of videos of people singing. I don't know why they like to get on their phone and sing in their bathroom, I guess, because the great acoustics in there. I'm not sure what it is, but I've seen a lot of those on the internet. I guess I watch way too much YouTube right now. But anyway, as you see those, I, you know, that's nice, but what does it matter if I'm singing and nobody hears it? Now, for you, that's a good thing if I'm singing and nobody hears it, but when people can sing, it's important that, that, that we hear it. But I'm just using that as an example of how we share our gifts, share our talents, and share ourselves with others so that others can experience the goodness of who God is. Because when we hold those things in, we are not only denying a blessing from ourselves, but more importantly, we're denying how God has created us. God has created all of us 
to be a part of what he's doing in different ways. All of us to share of the gifts and the goodness that we've been given so that others might experience God's love and God's mercy. And the condemnation for those who choose to harvest it all and hold it all to themselves is pretty severe here. As James says, that it, they're, they're, not only is their outcry over those harvesting reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath, but you have lived luxuriously on the earth with wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. That doesn't sound like a good place to be. You have been condemned and put to death the righteous man, and he does not resist you. You're not concerned with justice. You're not concerned with fairness. You're instead concerned with yourself and harboring up things and keeping things the way you want them to be rather than providing for others. But sometimes there are those in life that we see, examples of those who demonstrate a Christ-like compassion, a Christ-like giving, a, a sense of generosity to honor and encourage others to demonstrate that. And I want to share an example with you that I learned about many years ago, a story of a man. You may have heard his story. His name was R.G. Letourneau, and uh, Mr. Letourneau was a very wealthy uh, industrialist. He was uh, dedicated to his life. He, was, uh, he considered himself a businessman for God. His focus was he invented nearly 300 different inventions. And if you've ever seen those, those caterpillars, those big pieces of equipment, you know, with the giant tires that roll around, if you've ever been to a construction site or like that, he's the guy that invented the technology for that way back in the day, that created the technology for that and began, became very wealthy because of all this technology that created. But he committed to himself before he ever got rich, this didn't happen when he got rich, that 90% of everything he received from his, from his personal income, he was going to dedicate and give to the Lord's work. And he was really involved in some of, I don't know if you've heard of uh, different missions that would go in and fly into unreached people groups and airplanes and, and different ways of going into jungles and things of that nature, trying to find ways of groups that had never been reached. That was one of the things he poured his money into, was these different kinds of missions outreaches that would go into these outlying places in the world and share the gospel, where the only way he could get in was in an airplane or in a hike, and he would find ways to help fund this. And that was his vision. And when he's the one that is given that famous quote that you hear a lot of times that when we pastors do tithing service, he says, I shovel out the money and God shovels it back because God always has a bigger shovel than I do. He understood the principle of what he had been given. He had been given to be, to be a blessing to others. And that's what we are given in our lives. Everything we are given is given to be a blessing to others. Now, well, none of us in this room or in, the, in this, on the, or listen to me probably, excuse me, not in the room, maybe in the room too, but we'll never, we'll have the kind of resources probably that R.G. Letourneau had. But that's not the principle here that we, you know, we've got to wait till we accumulate enough to where we can give it and share it. We need to be giving what we have now toward the purposes, and king, toward the purposes of God. God is faithful to use what we give, much like the widow's might we talked about earlier. Whatever we are willing to share and give, what he puts upon our heart to give as we give that, he then uses that for his purposes to accomplish his vision and his mission. We know that works with our talents and our abilities, don't we? Some of you have experienced that in your lives. You give just a little and you say, you call and you accept the call to serve in a particular area of ministry. You're like, God, I don't know if I can do this. I, I don't know if I'm talented enough. And God says, be available. A lot of times we are concerned with the talents and the gifts and God is more concerned with our availability and our willingness to surrender. Say, God, whatever you want me to do, God, I will do it. I'll trust you. I, I don't know that I can, God. Well, you, you can do that. Trust me, he says. Let me lead you on this and let me accomplish what I desire to accomplish in and through you. And that's the heart of this text, the heart of really the gospel, isn't it? We're given the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the life transforming message of our Savior gives us eternal life, makes us members of the family of God when we give our lives to him. And because of his goodness, because of his grace and our, our willingness to surrender, he takes that and gives us a new life that we never would have had on our own. I can honestly say to you that when I became a follower of Christ, the life that I have lived since then is not the life I ever expected to live. I've been places I never thought I'd be. I've met people I never thought I'd meet. I've done things I never imagined that I could do or would do. And many of you can say that same thing about your life, how God has taken you on that journey and God will continue to take you on that journey and use you in ways you never dreamed of. But you have to allow him to do that. You have to give up your life. You have to surrender yourself to him and allow him to use you. And that's really what James, I believe, is talking about here. For many, it's a struggle. We'd rather hang on. We, we're, that temptation is, I, I want what I've got for me. And yet, the scriptures are clear. And James is very clear in his warning here that it's not about what you have. It's not about those things. What it's about is what you do with what you have. Your life is not 
And the things that you have are not so that you can just build up and accumulate. Instead, it's for you to use in the ministry and the encouragement of others. And that's where that verse 6 comes in there pretty harshly. Rather than give, rather than serve, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man, the one who is less fortunate to you, the one that cannot help you, the one that cannot sustain you. You have put him to death because of your unwillingness to help. James's struggle that we talk about with, with these early believers, some of them had come out of great systems of wealth, great, great ability, and great resources, is for them to understand the principle of the Scriptures that all that we have is God's. Everything. Even our lives, we understand and know that principle. Not a one of us takes a breath and shouldn't realize that that is a gift of God. Every breath we take, every moth, every ability we have to move, every, everything about us, our life, that our heart continues to beat. Do any of us in this, that, that listen, any of you listen to me, anyone in, have, have control over your heart and you can make it stop and start when you want? Anybody? I don't think so. I know I don't. The heart beats. I have no control over that. Yet God does and gives me daily life, allows me to continue to live. And what I have to understand is everything I have, everything that I have in my possession is his and given to me by him. And that's the core principle that I think James is trying to get across to these believers and to us today. It's all his. Give and honor him with what he has given you, that your life might testify to others of the goodness and the mercy of God. Live a life that is fully surrendered to him. And I know you hear me use that word a lot, and you'll continue to hear me use that word a lot because I believe it's an important part of being a follower of Christ, that you and I are surrendered to his purposes for our lives, that we allow what he has given us to be used for whatever he desires to help others. You know, I often have told stories for you here that I was raised in an era when people used flannel boards to teach Bible lessons, and many of you have no idea what a flannel board is. You can Google it. Uh, there are very interesting pieces, are very, very dated. I, I think it's like the precursor to video and all that kind of stuff, you know, that people used in a lot of churches. In the little church that I went to, that's what they did in the Sunday school department. Then I remember the lady had the flannel board, and it had the background on it of wherever she was, and she would put different things on the flannel board, and we just thought it was amazing, you know. You know, as a five, six, seven-year-old kid, I was just overwhelmed by this technology. But anyway, she would do that, and I can remember all those flannel. I remember so many of those stories of the Bible that she used and how she communicated that. But I think of that as, you know, how important that is, that, that means of communication for me as a child to understand what, understand what the Scriptures But I remember she did one on giving. In fact, she was talking very much, the, not the same text I had used, but one of the texts I mentioned, she used the widow's might. We did a flannel board of the widow's might. It was pretty, pretty incredible the way it worked out. And, but as I think of that story and how that sticks in my mind, I'm grateful for her willingness and the willingness of others to give of themselves, to spend the time to be away from family, to spend time with children, to, to give them the word of God, to teach them and encourage them, to make that sacrifice that she made in her life. And many of you have people like that in your lives, that because of their faithfulness, because of their willingness to give, their willingness to serve, they made a difference in your life because they were willing to give in to the purpose, to surrender the purposes of God for them. God used them to make a difference in you. And now God is calling you and I to do that same thing with those whom he brings our way, whether it's children's ministry, whether it's a Sunday school class, whether it's people that you work with, or whomever it is that God places in your way that gives you an opportunity to share his goodness and grace, let God use you to be the light to others, to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share the word of God with others so that others can come to know who God is by your, off, your example and your teaching and your time. But in order to experience what God has for you and for me, we got to say, okay, God, whatever you want is what I'll do. And I think at the heart of this text is really that attitude is what is missing in the church in James's day. I know a lot of times we think of the first century church as being perfect and being wonderful and everything worked out well. No, they had their problems because they, you know, that the church of the first century is like the church of today. It had people in it. And wherever you have people, you're going to have issues because people have issues. And because sometimes we get caught up in ourselves and sometimes we get misdirected and we get focused on things that don't really matter. And that's what happened to many of them. And James is using this, 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 this teaching here to help redirect them, to help them understand what really matters most is following your Savior. Realizing that everything you've been given is from Him. And I think as we truly embrace 
and hang on to that principle, it changes our perspective on possessions. It changes our perspective on money. It changes our perspective on gifts and talents because we begin to see God's the one that gives it all anyway. He's the owner of everything. Everything I have, I owe to him. He has given it to me. He has provided for me. He has given me that opportunity. So what I do with it is like an offering. It's like giving back to him. It's like demonstrating to him, to, to him showing him gratitude and showing the, for what he has done for me. It's thanking him for what he has done and given me in life as I share that. And that, should that not be the example of the church and followers of Christ? That we are willing to give of what God has given us so that others may know of the goodness and mercy of God. The life that we live is a life that is lived in surrender, a life that is lived to demonstrate his goodness and his mercy. It's not about what I have. It's more about what I can give. It's kind of like churches. We struggle, and in an era like this, as we're kind of not able to gather together for however long this lasts, and we, you know, we can't say, well, we had this many and that many, and sometimes we get caught up in that mindset that it's all about what we bring in. But faithfulness is not about as much about what you bring in, it's about what you give away, isn't it? The strongest churches are not the churches that have the most people coming in the doors. The strongest churches are those ones that have the ones going out the doors, not because they're mad, but they're being sent to do missions and ministry. The little church that I grew up in wasn't a big church. It wasn't a church that was the largest in town. It wasn't even the largest in the five-block area it was in because there was a church on every street corner of my hometown. It seemed like everywhere, and there was always bigger churches. But what made the church that I attended such a powerful influence, I think really it came from the leadership of our pastor and others, was how many people it set out into missions and ministry. And a friend of mine talked about this a while back. We were kind of having that conversation that the little church that I went to, I remember when I was there, there were 25 people that went into missions and ministry out of that little church. And this was a church that ran about a little bit more than us, about 170. That was it. And I think of that example that that was really more about what it's about, isn't it? It's not about what we're doing with our lives for us. It's what we're doing for the kingdom. And that's the principle that James lays out for us here. A life that is surrendered to God, a life that is demonstrating his goodness and grace, a life that's all about him and understands that everything we have is his, is a life that brings him glory and honor. I want to do something a little different as we get ready to close this morning. I want to provide you with an opportunity to think about the things that God may have said to you during this time as I preach. Now, we're, you know, traditionally here at our church, we do an invitation and we have an altar call and it's kind of not, we're not exactly doing it in that way, but we're going to give you that opportunity to respond to God's call on whatever he's placing in your life at this time. And you feel free to respond to me if you want to. If you would like to talk to me, I can respond to you electronically. We can do that. Or if you want to talk to someone else in the, in the group, talk to them about that and let God use this time to see what he's saying to you. So I'm going to pray here, and then we're going to close out our message to our time of worship and let God speak to you in whatever way he's calling you today. So pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for James's teaching this morning that we've been able to spend a little time in. And I pray, Father, that as we continue in this time of worship, Father, it's not just we just close up and we're done and we can say, oh, it's all over now, so we can get back to whatever, but Father, we allow you to speak to our hearts and to challenge us, maybe call us to a, a commitment in whatever that is. I don't know, Father, maybe some, we need to deal with some possessions of our own that we have. We need to say, Lord, I haven't fully surrendered those to you. Or maybe it's a talent and a gift God has given us, saying, God, I, I know you gave me this, but Lord, I, I haven't used it for your, to accomplish your purposes in my life. I've, I've kept it to myself. Whatever that is, I pray that God would impress upon you as the Holy Spirit speaks to you to do and make whatever decision you need to make. Father, use this time in whatever way you desire. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, before we close with our last song, I wanted to read to you from the very beginning of Romans chapter five, verses one and two. It reads, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And because of what, how God works in us, because of what Jesus did on the cross and through that grace, 
it's nothing we can do on our own, but it's through Jesus that we can stand and that we can glorify God and that we can surrender to him and do his will. And that's what the song's about, so let's sing. Once again, we thank you for joining us. We hope that God has used this time to speak to you and continue to help you in your walk with him. That's our hope and purpose in this. So we just pray your blessings, uh, God's blessings upon you in this time as you continue to follow him. God bless. We'll see you next week. You can feel free to join us for prayer meeting at 7 p.m. on Wednesday as well. God bless.